This video is the first in a series about the A-level chemistry topic of redox reactions and it's going to include a recap of what you should know from GCSE about reduction and oxidation and then introduce the idea of oxidation states, talk about what they are, how you calculate them and how you use them. So at GCC, you were introduced to the idea that the process where electrons are lost is called oxidation, the process where they're gained is called reduction, and if both of these processes happen, that's what we call a redox reaction. And these processes can be demonstrated using what we call half equations. Now, you would probably have met half equations in the context of electrolysis, but they are also applicable for chemical reactions like this one. So we've got some magnesium reacting with some hydrochloric acid to produce some magnesium chloride and some hydrogen. And if I'm going to write a half equation, I'm only going to look at one of the elements in the symbol equation. So on the left hand side, we've got magnesium metal in its elemental form, just as magnesium. But on the right hand side, in the magnesium chloride, we have magnesium as an ion with a two plus charge. Now, electrical charge must be balanced on both sides of the equation. So if we have a neutral situation on the left, we also need a neutral situation on the right. And that two plus charge has to be cancelled out by two electrons. So this is the correct half equation for magnesium. And as you can see, um, the magnesium atoms on the left hand side have lost some electrons and therefore we would say that magnesium has been oxidised in this chemical reaction. Then if we look at the hydrogen on the right hand side, it's present in its elemental form as a gas, as a diatomic molecule. And on the left hand side, it's present in its ionic form as hydrogen ions. And because that diatomic molecule requires two atoms of hydrogen to make it, we're also going to have two hydrogen ions and again the electrical charges need to balance so I've got two hydrogen ions with a single positive charge and therefore in order to balance that out um, to have a neutral charge because that's what we've got over here on the right hand side I'm going to need to add two electrons so the hydrogen ions have gained electrons and therefore they have been reduced Hopefully that wasn't too challenging for you. So in the first two instances, the species that's on the left hand side has lost some electrons because we've got electrons over here that have been split apart and we've been left with a positive ion. So the first two are going to be oxidation because electrons have been lost. And then in the second two examples, um, the species on the left hand side has gained some electrons to make some negative anions. And so those are um, reduction. And then in the final two examples, uh, we've got electrons being lost again. So again, it's oxidation. The first new piece of information we're going to give you is some new vocabulary. So you know that if an element loses some electrons, it's been oxidised. But those electrons must have gone somewhere. So there's going to be another chemical that is accepting those electrons. And we're going to call that the oxidising agent. It's the thing that is oxidising the first element. So here's an example. We've got some fluorine displacing some chloride ions from some potassium chloride and the fluorine is accepting the electrons that have come from those chloride ions. So we're going to call it an oxidising agent. Then the flip side of that, you know that reduction is the gain of electrons, but those electrons need to have come from somewhere. So we're going to call whatever donates the electrons a reducing agent. So again, we've got an example of a displacement reaction. Here we've got some potassium and that is going to give away an electron and it's going to be accepted by the silver in the silver nitrate. But so we call the potassium a reducing agent. Now, it can be worth saying explicitly that an oxidising agent will be reduced because an oxidising agent is accepting electrons, it's gaining them. And a reducing agent is going to be itself oxidised because it's donating electrons, it's losing electrons. So your oxidising agent oxidises something else but is reduced itself and your reducing agent reduces something else but is oxidised itself. So here's an opportunity to pause the video and make sure that you're confident identify oxidising agents and reducing agents, if they're there. For each question, you're looking for a single species, so either an element or an ion, which is gaining or losing electrons. If you are looking at an ion, then you need to make sure you put down the charge of that ion. You don't just pretend that it's an element on its own. So pause the video and make sure that you can do these five questions. Hopefully you managed that OK and you didn't get caught out by question three, which is actually not a redox reaction. It involves ions being moved into different combinations, but nothing is actually oxidised or reduced.
So we've got the oxidizing agents here in blue and the reducing agents in pink. So let's just have a quick look here. So we start out and we've got some chlorine in its elemental form. And then over on the right hand side of the equation, it's become chloride ions. So that tells us that the chlorine has been reduced and therefore it's functioning as the oxidizing agent. Um, in our second question, we have some um, copper two plus ions here in the copper chloride, uh, which are then going to gain some electrons and turn back into copper atoms on the right. So it's the copper ion, the copper two plus ion that is functioning as the oxidizing agent. Our third question, as we said, is not actually a, um, a redox reaction at all. That one's in there as a bit of a red herring. In our fourth question, it's the um, the oxygen, the molecular oxygen, which is gaining electrons from the lithium and turning into oxide to minus ions. So that is being reduced. That is acting as the oxidizing agent because it's oxidizing lithium. It's taking the electrons away from lithium. Um, and then finally, in our last example, we have our um, titanium in titanium chloride is there as a four plus ion because the chloride ions are going to have a single negative charge and there's four of them. And that is going to gain some electrons from the magnesium. And so it's acting as an oxidizing agent. And then our reducing agents, we've got the iodide ions and the potassium iodide, which are um, going to lose their electrons. They're going to give them to the, um, the chlorine molecule and, uh, and just turn back into an iodine molecule over here. We've got some um, aluminium atoms, which are also going to um, then be a reducing agent and turn into aluminium three plus ions over here in aluminium chloride. Uh, third one we said is not redox. And then uh, question number four, we've got some lithium atoms which are going to um, give up electrons. So they themselves are going to be oxidized and therefore they're going to be a reducing agent and they're going to turn into lithium ions on the right hand side. And then finally, our magnesium is also going to give up some electrons. It's going to act as an electron donor, which is what a reducing agent is. And it's going to turn into magnesium two plus ions over here. So sometimes it's really straightforward to see where the electrons have moved in the chemical reaction, but sometimes it's not, particularly if the elements are locked up in compounds. And so it can be useful to have a number that represents the number of electrons that have been lost or gained by an atom of an element inside a compound. And we call that number an oxidation state or an oxidation number. In practice, you don't actually count the number of electrons that are moving because there are a bunch of rules. And if you learn the rules, then it's much, much faster to just use them. So we're going to do that instead. The first rule is that the oxidation state of an element is always zero. So that could be something that goes around as single atoms, as a small molecule, or even a giant structure like a metal. If it's in its elemental form, its oxidation state is zero. The second rule is that the oxidation states of all the atoms in a neutral compound will add up to zero. So if you take a molecule like carbon dioxide and you know what the oxidation state of oxygen is, you can use that to work out what the oxidation state of the carbon must be because you know that you must be able to add them all up to get to zero. Linked to that, if instead of having a neutral compound, you have a compound iron, like, say, a carbonate iron with a two minus charge on it, the oxidation states of all the atoms in the iron have to add up to be the charge on the iron. So the carbon plus the three oxygens in that carbonate iron, if we add up all of their oxidation states, we would get two minus, which is the um, charge on the carbonate iron. Finally, to allow us to actually do number two, some elements have standard oxidation states. There are six rules for you to learn, although they are quite straightforward and quite intuitive and make sense. If you're not sure what order to go in, you always work from the most to the least electronegative. So you're not really expected to know the entire electrochemical series. But if you think about the three elements that are involved in hydrogen bonding, you're going to start with fluorine, which is the most electronegative. Then you move on to oxygen. Then you move on to nitrogen. And then it kind of becomes everything else. So since we're going with fluorine first, the first rule is that fluorine always has an oxidation state of minus one. And note it's minus one, not one minus. Then we've got oxygen, which is going to be minus two, apart from two special considerations. One is if it's bonded to fluorine, because we've already said fluorine is king, fluorine goes first, fluorine is always minus one. The other exception is if the oxygen is in a molecule called a peroxide. So a peroxide is where you have oxygen bonded to itself, like in hydrogen peroxide, and then its oxidation state will be minus one, but you're very unlikely to meet one of those. Then we move on to chlorine. Chlorine is also minus one, as are all the rest of group seven. But basically, the higher up you are in group seven, the more likely you are to 
win because the more electronegative you are. So chlorine will be minus one unless it's bonded to fluorine. So if you had a diatomic molecule with fluorine bonded to chlorine, fluorine goes first. It's the first rule because it's the most electronegative. It's minus one. And then that whole molecule has no charge, so zero. So therefore, the chlorine would have to be positive one. But basically, unless there's any fluorine involved, chlorine is also going to be minus one, as are the rest of group seven. Group one metals are always going to be plus one. Group two metals are always going to be plus two. You see where this is going. Note that it's plus one and plus two, not like you would do with charges on ions, um, two plus. And then lastly, we've got hydrogen. So hydrogen is always going to be plus one, like the group one metals, unless it's in something called a metal hydride. So in the same way that chlorine will be minus one unless it's bonded to something that's more electronegative, and then the fluorine kind of wins and takes the electrons, the hydrogen is going to be plus one unless it's reacted with, say, sodium, because then the sodium from group one is going to be plus one and the overall compound has no charge. So therefore, the hydrogen must be minus one. Those rules tell you about a lot of elements in the periodic table, but not all of them. So you need to be able to work them out for unknowns. So here we've got some potassium manganate and we're interested in the oxidation state of everything that is in that compound. So to start off with, our second rule is that oxygen is always negative two. So I've got four oxygen atoms, each with an oxidation state of negative two. I also had a rule that said that group one metals always had an oxidation state of plus one. And now I know because this is an uncharged neutral compound that the sum of all the oxidation states must be zero. So if I have my four oxygen atoms with oxidation states of minus two, that makes minus eight. And then I add into that my one potassium atom with a plus one. And then if I add to that the oxidation state of the manganese, it has to all sum to zero. So therefore, my manganese must have an oxidation state of plus seven. Here's another opportunity to pause the video and make sure you've understood this by writing down the oxidation state for each element in these questions. Hopefully that wasn't too hard for you. So in question one and question three, we've got elements, so they have an oxidation state of zero. For question two, you could use either rule. You could either say that oxygen has um, an oxidation state of minus two and therefore use that to figure out that hydrogen would be plus one, or you could work it out the other way around, or you could just use both rules. Then for question four, remember fluorine kind of goes first because it's the most electronegative. So fluorine is minus one and chlorine is therefore positive one because overall that compound has um, no charge and therefore has an oxidation state that sums to zero. And then finally, in the iron oxide, um, we know that oxygen has an oxidation state of minus two. We know that overall the compound has no charge and therefore the oxidation states have to add to zero and therefore the iron must be plus three. Here's a similar idea, but with a compound iron instead of a neutral compound. We know that hydrogen has an oxidation state of plus one, and we know that the ammonium iron has a single positive charge. So the oxidation states of all the atoms in that iron must add up to be plus one. So four lots of one plus something make plus one. Therefore, the oxidation state of nitrogen must be minus three. Pause the video again here and check that you can confidently write down the oxidation state of each of the elements in each of these compound ions. In the first question, we've used the oxygen rule and the hydrogen rule to work out that the oxidation state of carbon is plus four. In the second one, we've got an interesting situation where chlorine is bonded to oxygen. And remember, because oxygen is more electronegative, you use that rule first. So since oxygen is going to have an oxidation state of minus two and there are three of them, that makes minus six. So to get back to minus one, which is the charge on the iron, chlorine must have an oxidation state of plus five. Then for number three, we do a similar thing. We've got the hydrogen rule and the oxygen rule. And these show us that phosphorus must have an oxidation state of plus five. Then for number four, we've got a chromate iron. So we've got, again, oxygen always minus two, unless it's in a peroxide. Um, and so our chromium iron has an oxidation state of plus six. So um, if you've ever watched Erin Brockovich and heard of hexavalent chromium, this is your hexavalent chromium. It's got an oxidation state of six, hence hex. And then finally, we have a bromate iron. It's actually exactly the same idea as number two. So you use the fact that oxygen is going to be minus two to work out that overall the bromine has an oxidation state of plus five. 
So you can now calculate the oxidation state of any element in a compound. But you might be thinking, well, what's the point in this? Why would I bother doing it? The thing is that sometimes when you look at a chemical reaction, it can take a little while to figure out what's been oxidized and what's been reduced. But if you can work out the oxidation states, then this is much faster. So if an element's oxidation state has gone down, if it's become more negative, so it's reduced, then that element has been reduced. And if the oxidation state has gone up, if it's become more positive, then that element has been oxidized. So earlier we looked at this reaction between magnesium and hydrochloric acid. And if we work out the oxidation states for each of these elements, we can work out quite quickly what's been oxidized and what's been reduced. So we know that the elements are going to have oxidation states of zero. Um, the hydrogen ions will have an oxidation state of plus one. The chloride ions will have an oxidation state of minus one and the magnesium will have an oxidation state of plus two. So if we look at those numbers, you can see that for the chloride ions, nothing's changed. Um, so they're what we call spectator ions. They haven't actually been oxidized or reduced. And then um, the hydrogen ions have gone from being plus one to zero. So that oxidation state has reduced and therefore the hydrogen ions have been reduced. And then counter to that, the oxidation state of the magnesium has increased from zero when it's in its elemental form to plus two when it's formed ions and therefore the magnesium has been oxidized. Here's another opportunity to pause the video and make sure that you can write down what the oxidation state of each of the elements is and therefore work out what has been oxidized and what has been reduced, if anything at all. Some of these are not redox reactions. So if we look at these, we start out and lithium and hydrogen both have an oxidation state of zero because they're elements. And then lithium is going to have an oxidation state of plus one. So therefore it's gone from zero to plus one. It's been oxidized and hydrogen has gone from zero to minus one. So it's been reduced. In our second equation, there's actually no redox. We've just had different ions moving around into different combinations, but nothing has changed oxidation state. Um, in our third one, we've um, we've got a partial equation here, an ionic equation, um, and the calcium has changed from calcium atoms to calcium ions. Um, so it's gone from an oxidation state of zero to plus two, and it's been oxidized, whereas the hydrogen ions have gone from plus one to zero, and they have been reduced. Our fourth equation, again, is actually not a redox reaction. And then in our third one, this was a little bit trickier, we've had the manganese ions being oxidized and the, um, and the chlorine in the chlorate ion has been reduced. If you're not super clear on that last one, um, we start out and you have um, oxygen obviously has an oxidation state of minus two and there's two of them. So that makes minus four in total. This is a neutral compound with no charge. So therefore, our manganese must have an oxidation state of plus four at this point. Um, and then on the other side, we've now got four oxygen. So we've got um, minus eight overall. We've got an overall charge of minus two. Um, so here the manganese must have an oxidation state of plus six. So from here to here, it has um, increased rather than reduced and therefore it's been oxidized. And then at the same time, we've got in our chlorate iron here, we've got three oxygens, each with an oxidation state of minus two, which makes minus six and an overall charge of um, a single negative. So the chlorine here must be plus five. Remember, chlorine is usually going to be minus one, but if it's bonded to something that's more electronegative, like fluorine or oxygen or nitrogen, then that kind of that wins, that rule goes first. So we use the oxygen rule rather than the chlorine rule. And then over here, we've just got a chloride ion on its own, which does have um, an oxidation state of minus one. So from plus five, to minus one is a reduction and therefore the chlorine has been reduced. Finally, in this video, we have one more new word to add to your vocabulary, and that new word is disproportionation. So if something is oxidized, it's lost electrons. If it's reduced, then it's gained electrons. And disproportionation is when one species undergoes both of those processes in the same chemical reaction. So just as an example here, we've got some hydrogen peroxide decomposing to make some water and some oxygen. So in the hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen has an oxidation state of plus one and oxygen has an oxidation state of minus one because this is a peroxide. It's where oxygen is um, bonded to itself. Um, and then when um, when that decomposition happens, we have water in which hydrogen is plus one and oxygen is minus two. But we also have elemental oxygen, which because it's an element has an oxidation state of zero. So from minus one to minus two, that's a reduction but from minus one to zero, that's an oxidation. So we can say that oxygen has been both reduced and oxidized. It has undergone disproportionation.
Thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful. Our next video will be about writing half equations, so don't forget to subscribe.